it's a it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, it's a real honor, uh, and it's it's quite uh, humbling uh, because um, I I am not a botanist, um, and uh, the 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 real botanist in my family, my my wife, uh, a fierce gardener, uh, unfortunately couldn't come with me. Uh, much to regret, things uh, things at home required her to stay there. Um, but she would have really enjoyed this meeting. Um, you know, my wife Grace, most mornings this time of year, can be found in our garden, sort of pacing around, watering, weeding, sometimes just looking. She's always coming up with the final idea that will finally make the garden all fall into place after, after 13 years. So sometimes I'll come out and uh, greet her, you know, bring some coffee out, and then she says, let's go for a tour. And so we walk around our little garden, uh, and she will point out the, the flowers that are in bloom and the shrubs that are doing well and the, the trees that aren't doing well for some reason she can't yet figure out. Uh, and along the way, she'll point at a flower and say, do you remember what that is? <laughs> do you remember what that is? How do you know that that's a grass or a sedge or whatever? Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an earnest student, but maybe not an excellent one. Um, so um, in any case, I come to you in all humility. Uh, as, as a journalist who writes about nature, and sometimes that actually includes plants. Um, and so I wanted to talk to you about uh, writing about science and the challenges that it poses, and in particular, what it's, what it's like to write about plants. Um, as was mentioned before, um, I went to college at Yale. I was, a, I was an English major. Um, I just knew I wanted to write. I didn't really know what. Uh, so I would just take classes about writers who I just wanted to learn from. So Melville, for example. Um, and at the time, I was thinking of it mostly in terms of literature, um, although he was writing an awful lot about the natural world, not just whales, but all sorts of things, and writing about it in a very compelling way. Um, I wasn't the sort of person to put two and two together, um, but I was fortunate to um, get a job, uh, an entry-level good job as a copy editor at Discover Magazine, uh, a science magazine where I could learn about writing, and writing in particular about science, which I had always liked, and suddenly I discovered there was a place that you could do both. Um, I will point out and show my age that I started when magazines had these white pieces of paper on the cover. Um, these were called mailing labels. <laughs> because there was, in fact, a time before you would actually read the news on your phone. That would have been kind of absurd. Um, but in any case, um, Discover was a, was a wonderful place to, to learn about, about science writing, about all sorts of things. Um, it's one of the few places where you can uh, just get curious about something and figure out how to write a story about it uh, and get paid. Uh, so for example, I, I was always sort of curious about pterosaurs. Um, you know, since maybe seeing them in King Kong, I suppose, they seemed like and things that couldn't really exist in real life. But I wondered, uh, gee, I wonder what scientists are learning about pterosaurs. <clears throat> so I found that there was a, uh, a, a postdoc at the American Museum of Natural History who was, was f describing all sorts of new pterosaurs uh, from Brazil. <clears throat> Called him up and he said, yeah, come on up. Uh, and which is how I discovered that scientists are always incredibly uh, giving of their time, which is, is another great privilege. Um, and so you, you go in, I would go into the museum, which I'd gone to ever since I was a kid, but Alexander uh, sort of led me along and, and you know, maybe it was like by the diorama of the moose or something like that, and there was this door that I didn't even know was there. He takes out keys and opens it up and we go in to this other part of the museum the much cooler part of the museum <laughs> that no one gets to see. And, and uh, fortunately, I, for the first time, I was able to see it. Um, and we go to his lab, and he's got skulls of the most bizarre things beyond imagining, really. This, this made King Kong look like a boring documentary. 
but these are real. Um, so I, the title of my talk is Plants Are Weird, but everything's weird, and I mean that in a good way. Um, and so, for example, I was discovering how weird pterosaurs really were, and this was only some of the things that are just coming to light. And so then I was able to write an article for Discover about how scientists like Kellner were, were bringing these bones to life to show pterosaurs as, as living, breathing animals, um, animals that could be social and live together in, in huge groups, animals that were as big as airplanes and would really you know, challenge the biological uh, limits of flight. Uh, and I, we could even get the artist Carl Buell to, to make paintings. So thing, experiences like this really showed me that this was a kind of work that I just wanted to hold on to very tightly. Um, another nice thing about writing about science is that um, you can actually be there when scientific history happens. So for example, whales uh, have long been a big puzzle for biologists, another animal. Uh, indulge me for a little while. Um, this thing about whales is that they really, they're in the water, and yet they're really not like fish, and it's very puzzling, which has led to all sorts of weird speculations that they're just sea monsters. When anatomists looked, looked inside of these whales, they realized what they were dealing with was basically a mammal wrapped inside a fish, which is very strange. Uh, and so there were all sorts of debates about, well, was it really a mammal? Was it really a fish? Uh, and you know, what, what Darwin realized was that um, actually you know, these whales that are in the water their whole life, they're more closely related to us than they are to the fish that they share the water with. So Darwin interpreted this, <clears throat> interpreted whales through his theory of evolution uh, and, in which he was imagining species branching off of a tree. Uh, and so he reasoned that whales must have evolved from land mammals. Uh, actually, in the first edition of The Origin of Species, he uh, recounts some story he heard about bears in America that would swim around with their mouths wide open and bugs would fly into their mouths. And so he imagined somehow that this is what the early whales were like. And, and actually, he was called out in print about this, and he was mocked so mercilessly that he took it out of future editions. So this was, a, this was an idea that was a little too far even for Darwin, and, and he really kind of left things there. I mean, part of the problem was that whales and land mammals were divided by such a huge anatomical gulf that without fossils to help, that you know, all he could do was leave this conjecture there. And this was something that creationists would uh, lord over evolutionary biologists, like, ha ha, you can't find the, this transition, so therefore evolution must be wrong. So while I was uh, at Discover, um, a scientist named Hans Tevesen and his colleagues were digging in Pakistan, <clears throat> and they found this amazing fossil, which has some key traits uh, that are only found in whales, especially in the skull. But as you can see, uh, had feet. This is a whale with legs. Uh, and when you reconstruct it, it really kind of looks kind of like a giant hairy kind of alligator, maybe. Um, and it probably led this amphibious kind of life. This was a, this, this was the kind of thing that Darwin had predicted. But it wasn't until the 1990s that it was discovered at last. Uh, writing about that first discovery of Ambulocetus was very exciting. Um, one of the challenges with, with journalism is that you, know, you want to write one article and be done with things, but actually science is bigger than that. <clears throat> science doesn't stop when you publish your article. Things keep moving on, which, which is annoying, but obviously that's how it has to be. So in the case of whales, for example, um, uh, scientists found lots more uh, of, of these walking whales, a whole diversity of them, uh, and some truly amazing forms that would be very hard to have predicted in advance. 
This is just a few of them, I should point out, just sort of put together in this one group portrait. Um, their life, they lived, you know, separated by millions of years, but this gives you just a sense of the diversity of these early walking whales. Uh, and, and so I started to sort of see that there was like a bigger picture that I, that to tell that maybe was too big for an article, uh, because you could start to see the more of these uh, fossils started coming out that they were really uh, bridging that gap in a, in a really amazing way. Um, you know, whales didn't just jump into the ocean and start looking like dolphins. Um, the, you know, some of the earliest forms of whales include Pachycetus, and I just highlighted that, that back leg just to show you. It's, it's a pretty standard mammal back leg. <clears throat> Ambulocetus, as you can see, which lived a little bit later, um, <clears throat> has a shorter leg, actually kind of a wider foot, kind of kicking like an otter. Then there was another species called Basilosaurus that lived 40 million years ago. It's about a, as big as a school bus, but it had these legs that were about as big as a child's and they actually still had toes and ankle bones and so on. Um, <clears throat> obviously, they weren't using these for walking around anymore. They were fully committed to life on land, life in the water. Some people have speculated that maybe they, these kind of helped them to kind of grab onto each other during mating. Um, I, I'm not sure how you test that hypothesis, but uh, it is striking that, you know, the bones are, are all Many of the bones are still there, very reduced, but, but still there anyway. So the, the bigger picture is really what Darwin was envisioning, which is, which is a tree <clears throat> where you can see these transformations happening over time. Uh, and so that actually, that experience then led me to, to uh, working on books. Um, so that was kind of how I ended up writing my first book, which is called At the Water's Edge where I was, was trying to look at how these big transitions happen and how scientists study them uh, using a couple examples. One, whales going into the water. The other one, about 300 million years earlier when uh, our ancestors came out of the water to begin with. Um, so, so that experience um, you know, really kind of lit a fire under me and I wanted to write more books and I wanted to write for other places. So <coughs> um, I moved on from Discover, but I was very much those 10 years really kind of forged me my experience as a science writer. And I started to look back at my earlier kind of uh, unwitting training to be a science writer. Um, so for example, you know, now I look back at Moby Dick as being a wonderful example of science writing. Um, you know, all the English professors, when they go through Moby Dick, they kind of want to skip all the, all the whale chapters. Like, ah, oh, you know, whatever, who cares? Um, I go back through them and I'm just uh, amazed. Uh, and I, if, if anybody hasn't read Moby Dick in a while or haven't read it ever, I would hardly recommend it as scientists. Um, there's this wonderful line he has in it, um, he says, to have one's hands among the unspeakable foundations, ribs, and very pelvis of the world, this is a fearful thing. What am I that I should essay to hook the nose of this Leviathan? And that's a, actually, like, that's a, that's a nice motto for science writing, uh, I, I would say. Um, and again, I'll apologize that Melville is using zoological metaphors here. <laughs> um, but that may be part of a bigger problem that I'll address a little later in the talk. Um, so after uh, leaving Discover, I uh, went on to write uh, a number of books. I'm working on one right now about heredity. Um, and I also got to um, work uh, for the New York Times, uh, and I've been there for 12 years or something like that. I've been contributing to them started out working on, on features. Uh, <clears throat> so this is a feature I wrote about the evolution of snakes and the evolution of venom. Uh, and in the past three and a half years, I've kind of, they just basically said, just write a column every week. Let's just make this simple. So that's what I do. So my, my column called Matter comes out every week. This is just an example of some of the things that I've written about recently. <coughs> um, and 
sometimes I, in, in that mix, I will write about plants. Uh, this is just a picture I took this morning. Um, one of the reasons I like to write about plants is because in writing about science, um, I, I like to start with things that people are familiar with. Um, I like to, I, wa I'm going, I wanna take them into the, into, deep into scientific research, but um, I need to like start the tour somewhere else. Uh, because I'm not writing for you, um, I'm perfectly happy if you read my stuff, but I'm writing for non-experts. I'm writing for people who, um, God forbid, didn't even major in science in college, or maybe didn't go to college. Uh, and so, so it's really important to me to find um, as broad of a sort of point of common interest that I can where I can start my stories. So plants actually offer a wonderful example of that because we're surrounded by them. Um, so I don't need to tell someone what a tree is. That's nice. Um, and so not only are we surrounded by plants, but, but we depend on them and we, we have this very intimate relationship with them. Um, and sometimes we might even forget about that relationship. Um, so, so for example, um, after taking this stroll around Savannah, <coughs> I had a cup of coffee uh, at uh, the, uh, I guess it was called the Collins uh, Cafe, lovely place. So I had a lavender mocha, which I highly recommend. So I was drinking plants, you know. I was, I was uh, having, having coffee, which is a plant. And so, so being able to connect to people by what they drink, what they eat, is also another great way to sort of draw people into important science. So uh, this is one example of, of a story that I've, I've written. Um, it's a, it was a story about flowers, about angiosperms. Uh, and I can take advantage of the fact that everybody knows what a flower is. Um, and then I can try to like bring them back in time to a time when there were no flowers. That's actually kind of hard for most people to imagine. Um, and, and to then ask, well, how did we go from a world without flowers to a world with flowers? Um, and what's nice is that this is kind of a um, botanical equivalent of the story of whales that I was telling you about before, in that this is an old question, and this is another one of those questions that drove Darwin a little nuts. Um, you know, he referred to it famously as an abominable mystery. <clears throat> and so, in the past couple decades, uh, there's been some really exciting work on trying to figure out what, uh, you know, how angiosperms evolved. And there, are, you, you can talk about fossils, you can talk about developmental genetics, you can talk about biodiversity by people going and looking for flowers that still you know, give you sort of a basic clue about the early stages. Um, now, in, in a story like this, I have to be careful because like, you know, I don't want to say like, oh, problem solved. Um, this was actually in 2009 and obviously a lot, I, I'm well aware that, you know, the, the origin of angiosperms is something that people are investigating furiously um, today and there's plenty of debate about it. Um, so, <clears throat> But at the very least, um, you know, there were some new papers that came out when this, uh, around the time I decided to write about this, that provided me the occasion to introduce readers to this mystery and to, to you know, to introduce them maybe to some species like, like uh, this one that, you know, they may not have ever heard of. You know, some, some tiny little flower on some remote Pacific island suddenly could have a great meaning to you know, a reader just living in you know, suburban United States. I mentioned uh, coffee before, um, and uh, it, it turned out uh, uh, in, uh, a couple years ago that there was a, a paper on the, the genome of a coffee plant that was published. And um, usually, uh, if a genome is published, I, at this point, I don't care very much. <laughs> no offense, I, I know it's hard work, I know it's important, 
I know it's valuable, but um, as a journalist, at this point, you know, sequencing a genome just isn't, it isn't news. You know, it's, it's, it's another genome to add to all the thousands of genomes of species that we've already got. Um, so for me, what's interesting is what, is there a story is that, that the genome is being used to tell? Is there, is there some discovery about evolution that you can, you can learn about now that you have the genome that you might not have known before? And it just so happened that there was a very interesting uh, uh, story that was in this, this genome paper, which is basically that uh, they, can, they were able to trace how, ca how caffeine evolved as a molecule, how, how it e evolved from sort of precursor molecules, um, both in coffee and then comparing it in terms of tea and other plants that have, um, that have caffeine as well. And it looks like it's convergent evolution. So caffeine is, is kind of a story like, like you know, birds and bats. Um, and this is particularly important to me um, as, um, in terms of presenting evolution to the public because, uh, you know, I write about evolution and, um, you know, long before vaccines were controversial or global warming was controversial, it was evolution. So, <coughs> you know, at Discover Magazine, I was the... I was the one who got the hate mail first, um, and, and I still get it, and that's okay. But um, you know, the creationists have really tried to um, exploit the fact we don't know everything about molecular biology to say that evolution can't be real because we don't know everything about molecular evolution. Um, so it's important to me to, to, to tell stories about research that actually starts to illuminate the molecular side of evolution. Um, you know, whale fossils can tell you a lot about, you know, morphology, about, you know, actually tracking a leg as it changes over millions of years. There's not going to be a, 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 mo a molecular uh, fossil of caffeine, um, but, you know, the, the, the clues are there. They're embedded in these genomes. And so, you know, it's, it's a challenge to tell those stories. but. Uh, my hope is that by, by, you know, using an example like coffee and tea, uh, I have my reader's attention, and maybe next time they have their, their cup of coffee, they're going to think about it differently. That's the hope. <coughs> um, I, uh, as we mentioned before, I'm, I'm quite obsessed with pathogens and parasites. Um, because they're obviously incredibly important to just the way life is now. And, you know, you could argue that they're the, they're the winners, you know, they're the great success story in evolution because there are more of, them, more of them than us. And uh, so sometimes I'll write about plant diseases. Um, it turns out that uh, plants are really cool because they get uh, this weird pathogen called a viroid, uh, which is about as simple a life form as you could imagine. Um, it's, it's not a virus, it's just naked RNA, that's it. It's not in a nice little protein shell or anything like that. Um, it's a, and it, it's really about a, as, as good of a model of, of the earliest forms of life that you could imagine. And it's infecting plants. Now, were these viroids around four billion years ago? Well, actually, that's a, that's a big debate. I mean, some people actually think that viroids really were uh, the, you know, some of the original life forms, the first parasites. <clears throat> now, how they got from four billion years ago to infecting potatoes today, nobody has a clue. Um, there, there's a huge gap there. But, um, but it could be that to get some of our best clues about, about the origin of life, um, we just need to look at these funny-looking potatoes. Um, there, there is a, um, obviously, I don't need to tell a group of uh, botanists that there's a lot of controversy over genetically modified plants. Um, and, and this is, this is actually something that has, uh, originated, um, I would say, just in the time that I've been a science writer. Um, this wasn't an issue, uh, when I was starting out, but it has really exploded. And there, uh, I can't pretend to really understand the full psychology behind it, um, but 
as far as I can tell, some of it has to do with a sort of a sense of um, sort of the sacredness of species boundaries. You know, that, you, that you, you cannot move a gene from one species to another because that would be wrong. That would be dangerous. That would be tampering with the natural order of things. Um, and so it's interesting to me that, that plants have had a lot of uh, horizontal gene transfer. Um, and and uh, it, it can take some very dramatic forms. So I wrote about um, a paper recently um, about how ferns had acquired a gene that appears to actually help it to uh, survive you know, in low levels of light. Um, there's a, another a, a case about sweet potatoes where they apparently <clears throat> acquired a gene from another species right before domestication. So, you know, by the reasoning of some, some opponents of genetically modified foods, all sweet potatoes are verboten. Um, because they were they were engineered by uh, you know the great the great engineer that is evolution. Uh, so so uh, by uh, using you, I can use plants to to get at sort of a, a deeper point about you know how evolution actually works and how we need to be thinking about what's natural and what's not. I'm not saying that genetically modified foods are automatically safe and fine and whatever. But I am saying that um, the, the, I am trying to sort of tackle that the sort of emotional response to the very idea that genes are moving around. Um, you know, actually, if you get down to the level of bacteria, for example, forget it. I mean, it's horizontal gene transfer every day and for billions of years. Um, but, uh, but, but for some reason, people, you know, uh, feel more emotionally about plants than they do about bacteria. Um, as, as with my interest in, in evolution, I've also find it. In, uh, I find the the, the current de uh, debates about um, genetically modified foods, and, uh, plants, and these uh, so-called superweeds to be. It's very interesting to me. Um, on the one hand, uh, some of these genetically modified plants were introduced with the with the the, the promise that uh, that they would somehow um, beat weeds, that you could use pest, uh, herbicides on them in such a way that you wouldn't have to worry about weeds so much anymore. Um, there, there was uh, you know there was no way that that weeds could become uh, resistant to the kinds of uh, herbicides that they were using. Well, evolution has shown that that's not the case, um, and so we have uh, a growing number of weeds that are resistant to glyphosate and some of these other herbicides, and that's actually forced the, uh, the producers of some of these GM crops to have to kind of rethink how they're going to uh, deal with them. You know, they're trying to introduce now uh, crops that are resistant to other herbicides. Now, why they think that the weeds won't be able to get resistant to those, I don't know. Um, so, um, you know, so, so, you know, it, it's interesting, like, you know, kind of really trying to follow the science and, and really trying to, to, to think about these, these things, in a, these plants in an evolutionary perspective. Sometimes you get the feeling that, um, you know, people don't like you because you're, you're not condemning GM foods, and sometimes you get the feeling that the, you know, Monsanto people are, not, are none too pleased that you're showing that uh, even they are not immune to evolution. You know, it, I, it's okay. Um, you know, I just, what I just do is I just, you know, look for these stories and talk to scientists about what are, what are the bigger issues here, um, you know, that are linked to these new papers that are coming out about plants. Um, I'm finding also that writing about plants is a really useful way to talk about global warming. Um, it's a, global warming is one of these uh, big uh, problems that I, I just feel like our brains are not equipped for. Um, there are just so many ways that we can just sort of displace it. So, you know, people who want to deny global warming uh, can have lots of different ways of doing that. I get plenty of examples of that on Twitter. Um, 
but, uh, but even you know, people who, who accept the reality of global warming will you know, feel like, well, what can we do about it? You know, I'm sure we all flew here to, to come to this meeting and you know, used up lots of fossil fuels. What else are we going to do? You know, it's not like there was a solar-powered plane that we could choose from. Um, so, but to make people uh, try to try to make people aware of global warming is 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 a challenge because you know a lot of the most dramatic effects are things that are happening far away. They're happening on an island in the Pacific. They're happening in the Arctic, and obviously those things are, are important. But um, you know it's. It's, it's easy for readers to sort of disconnect from those, those things. So I, if I'm writing for a primarily American audience, I'm kind of interested in the examples here that show that global warming is happening now and that you can expect more of that in the future. And plants can provide a really good example of that. Um, so this is uh, Richard Premack at Boston University. Uh, he's on the left there. Uh, and he has been studying the plants that grow around Walden Pond uh, ever since Thoreau's time. And he can actually use Thoreau's uh, recordings as part of a data set to try to figure out what have been happening to the plants in Massachusetts over the past couple centuries. Uh, <clears throat> and they are uh, they're greening up and blooming earlier and earlier and earlier. So this is a place where you can show how spring is coming earlier. Uh, and you know this is this is something that you know uh, an American reader can appreciate. You know, I'm sure all those English majors who keep telling you how much they don't like dealing with science—they've all read Walden Pond. You know, this is this is this is hitting them in the sweet spot, and and this is a way to really sort of drive home that uh, that we're not talking about something happening in the future. The plants are responding to it now. Um, now, what do we do about it? You know, it's, you know, uh, aside from just figuring out a way to stop spewing carbon dioxide into the sky, you know, there are other things that people are looking into, and so I've been interested in writing about some of those things as well. And so one of the um, really controversial ideas is that, is to say, you know, global warming is happening so fast that uh, it's not enough just to, to bloom earlier in the year. Um, there are going to be a lot of species of plants and animals um, that are just going to be unable to uh, thrive where they are now. So their, their climate envelope is going to move. And the question is, how fast can they move with it? Now, if you're a bird, you know, you might be able to, to, to follow. Um, if you're a white bark pine, this could be trickier. <clears throat> and unfortunately, you know, white bark pines are already being hammered uh, by uh, uh, insect outbreaks. And so on top of that now, it looks like climate change is going to be hitting them quite hard. And so I wrote recently about um, how some scientists are talking about how the possibility of basically taking uh, the white bark seeds and just starting to plant them in places where it's predicted that it will be suitable for them in the next few decades. Um, and so this brings up all sorts of really um, deep issues about, you know, uh, about extinction, about, about what sort of control we should be having over nature. You know, is it right for us to be moving these things to new places? Will they then become themselves invasive species? Um, it's a big debate. Uh, and. It's an urgent one, but it's also you know a fascinating one as well because it brings up these these really profound issues. So, so again, by by writing about sort of the nuts and bolts of of this research that scientists are doing on plants, that's one way. That's another way that I can kind of bring readers into the to the the, the broader issues that really I think uh, uh, drive science. I mean, I think these are the things that, that scientists really feel very passionate about, um, but you know, they're, it's sort of in the background, you know, because like every day, like you're going, you're you know, you're checking out your seedlings, you're writing a grant application, you know, you're just doing all the stuff of being a scientist. But there are these big questions that that are driving you, um, and and 
I like to sort of get at those things by, through writing about uh, research like this. Um, the, the challenge in writing about research like this and trying to get at those big questions um, is that a lot of times the way I find out about this research is that there's a paper. Somebody's written a paper. You know, maybe I get my hands on a copy before embargo. And I'm looking at this paper, and I'm looking at stuff like this, <laughs> um, which is which is fine, it, you know, for what it is. But you know, you know, I won't be cutting and pasting. Uh, in, in, <laughs> Um, and so, you know, a big challenge in, in my work is to figure out how to tell this story um, so that readers understand the gist of what's happening um, without expecting them to be scientists as well. Now, um, you know, there are, there are w different ways that people can respond to this challenge, uh, and some are more effective than others. So one, so, so if you're faced with this, with saying like, oh, there's this really interesting paper and I want to tell people about it, but there's a lot of stuff in it, you know, so like, I guess I'm going to have to explain 454 reads and Sanger backends and the Nubler version of MAP ASM research for 0492 to end patch, 1817, 2010 and so on, and you know, all the way down to unigenes at the end. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to do that all. Um, I'm here to tell you that's not a good idea. Um, because, uh, you know, there's actually been a lot of study by psychologists about sort of information and, and how people <clears throat> take in information uh, and there, there's long been a sort of, you know, when we talk about ish, big questions like, for example, global warming, um, people say, well, people just don't know enough about it. We just need more information. It's sort of called a data deficit model. And so people just load in more information, and it doesn't help. Because just on a, on a very fundamental level, it's like it's kind of overwhelming if, you know, you're just waking up in the morning, and you just want to, like, read the paper, and someone is giving you, you know, a 20,000 word botany lecture. It just, it's, they're, they're gonna say like, I, I can't deal with this now. I, I just can't. Um, so, so the trying to like add in uh, more information is not gonna make things better. So, you know, so for example, like when I write my columns uh, for the New York Times, yeah, you know, they're supposed to be 900 words. I can get away with 1,000, you know. I, I, if I try to do 1,100 or 1,200, my editor will, you know, whack me on the nose with a rolled-up newspaper. So then you say, like, okay, well, if, if, I can't, if I can't have, like, infinite space to write about all this, all these bits of detail, well, I'll just try to squeeze it all into the room that I have. All of it. Um, and that doesn't work, and that is, that is like making a ship in a bottle, uh, so, so that you, you will end up writing something where every word is, every phrase is, is incredibly densely packed with meaning, and so tightly packed that really um, somebody who is coming new to this is not going to understand it, is not going to enjoy trying to understand it, and is not going to read it. Um, something else to, you know, I have to bear in mind is that no, no one is being paid to read what I write. You know, they, they can always just move on. Um, now that's not, maybe, perhaps that's a little different than if you're writing, say, for, you know, undergraduates or for your colleagues. But, but for me, like, I have to bear in mind that, that uh, if this is painful <laughs> for my reader, they may want to recoil from the pain. Um, Steven uh, Pinker uh, has written, recently written a wonderful book called The Sense of Style. Um, he himself uh, is a cognitive scientist and a really masterful writer. He's written books like The Language Instinct and How the Mind Works. And he recently basically decided to write essentially sort of an ele elements of style for science. And a lot of it is actually directed at scientists. 
and, and he really sort of pinpoints a big uh, challenge in, in writing about science um, for journalists and, and perhaps even more so for scientists themselves, and he calls it the curse of knowledge. So like, you know, a scientist spends years and years and years becoming a scientist and learning all this stuff, and now it's all in that scientist's head, and it's very difficult to, to imagine what it's like to be someone without all that stuff in their head. But the fact is that everybody is like that. You know, if you, if you are the world expert on water lilies, uh, I have some news for you. You know, most people, they, they know what a water lily is, but that's it, you know? <laughs> it stops there. Now, they might find it fascinating to learn more about water lilies, but you cannot uh, be resorting to all sorts of knowledge that only you have and that other people don't have. And this is a problem, and there's not an easy solution, but it, the, the only way to sort of deal with it is, is mindfulness, to, to be mindful that, uh, that there is this disconnect. And journalists will get this too, like, it, you know, if I've spent a week learning about coffee, um, you know, I, I have to remind myself that other people are, haven't been doing that. They've just been drinking it and been, you know, arguing over, you know, whether Starbucks or Pete's is best. I mean, that's, that's where, how they think about coffee. So I have to sort of put my mind in their, in their mind. Um, now, a lot of this gets down to the kind of words you choose, because, you know, if you, if you know what a word means, um, it can be very convenient to use a very jargony word to mean precisely what you want to say. Uh, that'll save you space. Um, but uh, Rob Dunn, an ecologist, uh, really uh, nailed it, I think, uh, with something he wrote a couple years ago about how you write. Um, he said, tritrophic is not a real word. Your reader does not know the words tritrophic, ecological assemblage, genomics, or parthenogenesis. That is not because your reader is dumb. It's because scientists made up those words and never told anyone but other scientists. Don't underestimate the intelligence of your readers. Readers can be very clever, but it is not their job to know all the words that you and the 12 people you call colleagues made up. Um, you know, I mean, I feel, you know, sometimes when I'm talking to people about science writing, I feel like I could just show what Rob wrote, did a, do a mic drop, and just leave, because that really uh, is so important, because, and the language starts with words. You know, you, you need to build up from there to, to how do you craft your sentences and what are the stories that you want to tell. But, um, but if you don't start thinking about the words you're choosing, it's going to be trouble. And it's not just trouble like, you know, your reader might be a little mystified. Um, these actually get down to issues of policy, public policy. So, for example, a few years ago, uh, some climate scientists put together a list of words that they and their colleagues use all the time. And they don't even think that this is jargon. And they, they, these scientists all are agreed on what these things mean, but <clears throat> guess what? Uh, they mean something else to other people. So, for example, uh, the third one from the bottom, manipulation, like data manipulation. Like, we manipulated the data. You could see that in a methods section. Well, you think that that means that you are just taking raw data, which you know has errors in it, and you're using a whole set of methods to reduce those errors. So you can just, you know, we're going to, like, not, we're gonna not, not even count some of the recordings that we, know, we can tell are wrong. Um, but if you start talking about data manipulation um, to anybody else, they're going to think that you are tampering, that you are cheating, that you are a fraud. Um, and this isn't hypothetical. This is actually uh, at, at, the, at the nub right now of a controversy uh, where some congressmen are hounding climate scientists, claiming that they are essentially making up global warming and it comes down to data manipulation. So, you know, choosing words is, is really, uh, a, really a major challenge in, in, in science writing. And, you know, literally like earlier tonight, my editor and I were, were arguing over a, a couple words 
in, in my next column. Like, is that right? Or are people going to just be set off and think the wrong thing? Um, it's a surprisingly important thing. Now, I'm talking a lot about words in the, in the written word, um, but I will say that in the, in the world of science journalism there are, and science communication, there are lots of different ways of telling a story, including telling stories about plants. Um, now, I don't know how many of you listen to Radiolab, but they just have a new episode out um, about plants, um, and specifically about forests, <clears throat> and basically how nutrients like carbon and nitrogen get shuttled around a forest between the trees and the fungus and so on. And it's a really wonderful example of how to convey botany uh, in, a, in a different medium. Um, and, and, it, and it's, um, it's very much sort of uh, focused on listening to people's voices and, and conversations uh, about what it's been like to study these forests and to learn more and more about how they're really kind of a creepy sort of collective than just sort of independent trees living on their own. Um, the website for that is down at the bottom. Um, I have also found that uh, it, I can write about plants that may not be familiar to readers, um, it re and, but it really helps if they're beautiful, uh, which obviously many plants are. Um, I, I discovered a few years ago that National Geographic had never done a carnivorous plant uh, feature, which boggled my mind, and I was like, we got to do this. Uh, and fortunately, uh, National Geographic is a sort of place where they, they put huge amounts of work into their photography. Um, and so Helene Schmitz Schmidt, actually went to a, a German botanical garden um, that has a huge collection of car carnivorous plants and spent weeks and weeks and weeks taking pictures of them. So I could talk about all those things that, you know, I love to talk about, you know, how Darwin was obsessed with carnivorous plants and, and how it is that a kind of ordinary plant evolves into a carnivorous plant. I mean, it's a transformation as interesting as whales or flowers. Um, and there's been some really fascinating research in recent years on that. Um, but, um, but I, you know, if there weren't for those pictures, um, that, that would have been a challenge, definitely. But um, I think w with those pictures, you know, readers can look at that and just say, what is that? And how does that work? And that pulls them into, into the story. Now, um, so, I, so I really do enjoy very much writing about plants, but I don't write as much as I probably should. I mean, I've actually had my editor at the time say, we need more plants. And I agree, but it's hard. Uh, and it's hard for some of the reasons I've talked about before, but, um, you know, in preparing for my talk, I was thinking, like, why is it, why is it hard? You know, why do, I mean, do we, we sometimes shy away from writing about plants. And I think part of it is that plants are weird in, or in the sense that they're weirder than animals. Uh, and by that I mean that like, you know, we have lots of parts. Plants have lots of parts. Whales have lots of parts, okay? But the parts in a whale are a lot like the parts in me, okay? So a whale has a brain and I have a brain. Whale has eyes, I have eyes. We have limbs, we have livers. We have a lot in common. I don't have that much in common with the flower. Uh, um, there's not a lot of homology. Um, there is some, but it's a kind of at a deep level, and there's just a lot of stuff, there's a lot of stuff in the plant world that just is, is just off there on its own. And there's, there's, no, there's no way that I can create a, a, an analogy, or a homology, or analogy, whatever, I don't know what the word is here, to, to convey to people, you know, how do I get people excited that, a, you know, in some flowers maybe a sepal evolved to be a petal? People be like, wait, what's a sepal again? You know, like, and there's no getting around that. I mean, that's part of the story. Um, and, the, you know, the more you get into botany, the worse it gets. <laughs> I, I, I uh, bumped into Ned Friedman, I don't know if he's here, and. Uh, uh, a few years ago, he was, he was telling me very excitedly about um, some work he was doing on, I believe it was on endophytes, and 
I had to like go back and afterwards and like look up and just make sure I knew exactly what he was talking about. You know, like this is like fundamentally important to being a plant, but um, it's there's so little connection to to our own biology uh, that it's really it can be really hard. And here I'm just talking about angiosperms. Let's not talk, start talking about hornworts. I mean, like you know, God forbid I have to talk about antheridiums or something in, in the New York Times. That would be editorial suicide. <laughs> now, if anybody has any, you know, helpful suggestions, thoughts about, you know, how, ways around this, I, I'm all ears, because, like, I, I, this is sort of an ongoing thing. This is, like, this is, this is part of me trying to be a better science writer. But I can recognize these challenges. And honestly, like when you're dealing with really complicated science, um, it really helps to be as anthropocentric as you can get. Um, so, so, re so I'm really interested in genomics, and <clears throat> I want to really explain how do scientists sequence genomes, assemble them, interpret them, and so on. And so I, cert I recently found the ultimate example of anthropocentrism. I got my own genome se sequence. Um, and then I took it to scientists and said, like, here, help, help me understand what's on here. Um, and so I was able to get into all sorts of very weird, obscure stuff, like, you know, endogenous retroviruses and all the rest. Um, but the readers would all sort of say, like, oh, okay, all this weird stuff, this is inside the journalist who's writing about it, you know? So that, that it keeps that connection close, so we don't sort of drift off and the reader just feels like they're lost. Um, so this is this is uh, this is a very uh, this is very helpful, and you will find a lot of the time that when when we journalists are writing about really complicated uh, biology, we not only stick with animals, we like to stick with humans. Um, which brings me to epigenetics, um, which is uh, you know the part of the title in my talk. So I've been really, uh, in addition to, to genomics, <clears throat> I find epigenetics deeply fascinating, uh, partly because I'm working on this book about heredity. And so writing about epigenetics, about how gene expression is controlled by basically how they're being physically arranged, you know, coiled up or covered with methylation and so on. Um, again, this is, this is challenging. It's, it's not always easy to get it past your editor. <laughs> and so, you know, you, you really want to focus in on, on issues that are important, like um, how does it affect human health? So if you smoke, does that affect the, the epigenetics in your cells? Um, are, you know, is cancer uh, partly an epigenetic disorder and so on? You know, really sort of, you know, as journalists simply say, news you can use. Um, and epigenetics um, has all sorts of, you know, fascinating, um, uh, you know, implications that, that you know, are, are being explored now, rather controversial to say the least, but, <clears throat> you know, there are these ideas that animals, um, you know, can experience things that alter their epigenetics and then they then pass that down to their offspring so that, you know, s experiencing stress can change uh, these methylation marks, which can then be transferred down to offspring, and so that actually leads to sort of physical changes in, in the offspring. And, you know, these are some quite, uh, you know, remarkable studies that, that you can find where you can actually um, <coughs> zero in on uh, on, on how, you know, in, in, individual sperm from fathers who have experienced something, you can uh, fertilize eggs with them, and then the offspring are different in some sort of way, in some sort of behavioral way or physiological way, and then their offspring are as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, there have been, you know, papers being published, you know, all the time about this stuff, and, you know, I, I find it quite exciting and so I've written about this recently. Um, I talked about um, some, of the, some of this research on, on uh, paternal epigenetics. Uh, and actually, there was a study where uh, basically uh, it, animal studies suggest that if fathers get obese, 
that this can affect their offspring uh, through epigenetics alone. And so some researchers actually did an experiment where they, uh, they uh, studied men who got their stomachs stapled um, and, so, and then lost a lot of weight. And then they looked at their sperm from before and after the procedure and they actually found that the epigenetics was changing um, a, as a result of that. Now whether that leads to you know, actual changes in their offspring, I mean, who knows? But in any case, this is, this is a quite an ex a really thought-provoking study, and you know, it's been interesting writing about it. Um, but you know, we journalists really do need to be mindful that um, we're really fanning the flames uh, of, of some pretty intense excitement about epigenetics. Um, epigenetics has gone from being kind of you know, obscure cell biology to basically um, sort of a new age sensation. Uh, and, and I'm not making this up. You can go anywhere you want and, and find you know, epigenetic this and epigenetic that. So for example, um, <clears throat> you can do epigenetic yoga therapy. Um, and so uh, as, as this uh, coach explains, the term epigenetic is the latest discovery in the science of DNA, <laughs> suggesting that the body-mind can be reprogrammed through the belief system. Didn't actually say that, but whatever. Um, discoveries in epigenetics are rewriting the rules of disease, heredity, and identity. Epigenetic yoga therapy employs a multifaceted biopsycho-spiritual lens to identify possible causes of distress or malfunction and teaches self-directed tools, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, obviously they're not gonna be analyzing your epigenome, but they will take your money. Um, <laughs> and this is just one of countless examples I could show you. And you know, we journalists are kind of complicit in things like this. I mean, there, there's no way around that. So for me, <coughs> my attitude is, you know, I don't want to be um, just a stenographer and just sort of writing down what some scientist tells me about how transgenerational epigenetics is proven, is real, is fantastic. There's a debate. There's a big debate. It's fierce. It's kind of nasty. And that's okay, that's what science is. Um, it's not like you know, botanists don't have debates either. Um, so uh, earlier this month I wrote an article basically dedicated to just what these skeptics are saying. These are people themselves who study epigenetics and they're just arguing that um, the case is far from made for a lot of the most uh, sort of dramatic claims. Um, and that's really important just to, re to, to, to really uh, re represent science accurately. But here's the funny thing, is that whenever I'm looking into epigenetics, I, you know, I look at reviews and so on, and they'll say, you know, there's, there's all this suggestive evidence of epigenetics in animals and plants but nobody ever talks about the plants. Um, and I actually had an interesting you know, conversation with uh, Robert Martinson at Cold Spring, and I, and who does a lot of this research, and I was like, so, okay, so you know, I've, I, I've learned that epigenetics is very kind of, you know, very early days, and really the, the link hasn't been very well established, but mostly I've been talking to animal people. What about the plants? He's like, yeah, I think it's, I think it's pretty clear. I mean, you know, there's a lot we don't understand about it, but, you know, epigenetics is really important for plants, including in a, in a transgenerational way. And it's fascinating to me that, you know, we journalists haven't said boo about this. You know, we're, because, again, I think our, our anthropomorphism has kind of, our anthropocentrism has gotten in the way of appreciating that plants are probably doing something really amazing um, that really might sort of make us have to rethink, you know, how generations work, how heredity works, and so on. Um, but because they're plants, we've been giving them short shrift. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, this could potentially have a lot of implications for, for agriculture and so on. Um, and, you know, I feel actually quite remiss that I haven't really been pursuing this. So I promise 
to you botanists that this is going to be one of the next things I'm going to write about because you know I'm I'm learning I'm learning more and more to to respect the plants. Um, so uh, I, do we have uh, time for questions or anything? Okay, great. So thank you so much for coming, and I guess we have time for questions. <laughs> <laughs>